Hi guys, welcome to your mammal set of video notes. So a lot of you I'm sure know a lot about mammals, but this is going to go over just some of the general characteristics and then the different groups of mammals. So evolution and characteristics. Mammals belong to something called class mammalia, and this includes 4,000 species. So the fossil record though documents the origin of mammals are actually from ancient reptile ancestors. So these fossilized skeletons show that early mammals had large eye sockets, meaning they were probably active at night, and they didn't compete with dinosaurs for food because mammals fed on insects. The fossils of the first mammals are pretty scarce, so they really weren't that abundant during the Mesozoic area or when the dinosaurs were around, but the tertiary period, which is roughly 70 million years ago, is actually named the age of mammals because during this time mammals rapidly increased in species and number. So they evolved, like I said, from a reptile group, and this group was called the therapids. So they have reptile and mammalian characteristics, as you see in these pictures to the right. And if you want a little more information, the textbook also has a good figure explaining this. So here's those characteristics of mammals. So all mammals have this list of characteristics, things like endothermic, which means we keep ourselves warm, have hair, well-developed brains, a heart with four chambers, so up until this point, right, most different groups of animals had two or three. As we move to birds and then mammals, we're up to four. So it has something called a diaphragm. There's a single lower jawbone. Most species have four different types of teeth, and they are viviparous, meaning the females carry their young into full development, which usually results in live birth. And the females then secrete milk from mammary glands, which helps feed their young. So the two major distinguishing features of mammals is having hair and producing milk. There are not any other animals that do this. Reptiles don't do this. Birds don't do this. So mammals are very unique in that they're the only ones that do these two things. There's also things called monotremes and marsupials. So only 5% of mammalian species are in these two orders. First up, monotremata. So this is infraclass ornith ornithodelphia, which just means bird birthplace. So ornithology is the study of birds, so ornitho. And they have one opening, also known as a cloaca. If you remember, reptiles have this, birds have this, amphibians have this. So these mammals also have a cloaca because they lay eggs. And they're actually not completely endothermic as well. Their body temperature is lower and it kind of fluctuates a little more than other mammals. There are only six species in existence and they're all in Australia and New Guinea. And the one that's probably most common to you is the duck-billed platypus, but there's also spiny anteaters called echidnas as well. So order marsupiala, this is infraclass metatheria, meaning after beasts, and these are what you think of when you think of a pouch, right? So there's 250 species of these, things like koalas, kangaroos, sugar gliders, and possums, and they give birth to live young, but they crawl to a pouch called the marsupium, which is on the mother's belly, and they go in there immediately after birth and attach themselves to a nipple where they nurse until they're actually mature enough to live outside of the pouch. Now we're into placental mammals. So infraclass eutheria just means true beasts. So there are some typical characteristics of placentals. So we carry unborn young in the uterus until they can survive completely outside the womb. And they also have something called placenta, which is how nutrients are transferred from the mother's blood to the baby's blood during the development of the baby. So the first order we're going to talk about is order Chiroptera, and this is made up of over 900 species of bats. They live all throughout the world except in polar environments, and they're usually active at night, and they communicate using echolocation. And maybe you can think of a different animal, right? Dolphins also use echolocation to help with their prey search in water. They feed on insects usually, although some can feed on fruit, fish, or even ones that feed on blood. Order Carnivora is also distributed worldwide, but these are the species that eat meat, and they have a highly developed sense of smell. They can smell their prey. This includes things like dogs, cats, bears, raccoons, sea lions, mink, seals, walruses, otters, all of these things are considered carnivores. Order Cetacea only has about 90 species worldwide, but these are known because they're nearly hairless, they have lots of blubber, and they're usually very streamlined because they live in water. 
as you can see, the narwhals above, right? All of them in cetacea live in water. So there's two types. There's toothed whales and baleen whales. So toothed whales are more of a large carnivore. They're going to feed on fish, squid, seals, other whales, dolphins. And these are things like the narwhals above, sperm whales, dolphins, and killer whales. Baleen whales are actually filter feeders and they don't have teeth. So they eat shrimp and small invertebrates that they filter through their baleen. So these are things like gray whales, blue whales, and humpback whales. Order Rodentia is the largest mammalian order with over 2,400 species. And they live on every continent except Antarctica. And as I'm sure you could guess from the name, these are your rodents. So squirrels, marmots, chipmunks, gophers, muskrats, mice, rats, porcupines. They are all considered rodents. Something unique about rodents also is that they have two incisors in each jaw, and these keep growing as long as the rodent lives. So they're used for gnawing, but that's why also they are constantly chewing on things because the teeth grow, and they eventually can actually grow through their lips if they're not gnawed down enough. And last up is order primates. So these are found all over the world, and Primates are unique because they have increased agility for arboreal habitats. So they all live in trees, around trees, they can go in trees. And these are omnivores. So unspecialized teeth, but they are, they eat both meat and vegetables. And they have grasping digits with nails and opposable thumbs, reduced nasal cavity, and enlarged eyes and brains. So these are things like lemurs, monkeys, gibbons, and great apes. So when we talk about mammals, hair is one of the number one things that comes to mind. So all mammals have keratinized hair. So a coat of hair, usually called a pelage, has two kinds of hairs. So one, we have long guard hairs that protect the dense, shorter under hairs. And then two is those insulating under hairs. And the hair is typically made of dead cells, so that's why if you have a dog at home or a cat, you know this, they shed, right? So their hair is typically shed, especially in terms of seasons. Hair is also important then to the mammal's sense of touch. And those air spaces are going to provide an insulating layer between the hair and the skin for them. It is reduced in large mammals that live in hot climates. And then of course we have our whales, like our aquatic animals that don't really have hair at all. The hair color, on the other hand, depends on the amount of pigment in the hair shaft. So most mammals typically have dark hair on top and light hair underneath. There's also some important glands that mammals have. So there's four major ones we're going to get into. Sebaceous glands are associated with the hair follicles. So they secrete oils, and this is what waterproofs skin and hair. If you have, if you're someone that has greasy or oily hair, you have a very high output of these glands. So the sudoriferous, sudoriferous glands release watery secretions, known as sweat, which helps cool down the body. Scent or musk glands are around the face, feet, or anus, and these secrete pheromones, which are really important for reproduction and establishing territory. And finally, the most important, I think, is the mammary glands. This is only functional in females, but this is how mammals support their young. This is how they reproduce. In terms of the skull and the teeth, there's a single lower jaw that all mammals have, and they have three bones in the ear, as well as something called a secondary palate. So the soft palate, as you can see up here in this picture, is an extension of the secondary palate, but it completely separates the nasal passages from the mouth cavity. Also, it's important to note that the teeth are different. So in reptiles, teeth are pretty much all the same, which we refer to as homodont. But in mammals, we have different teeth for different functions. If you look at your teeth, right, your front teeth look a lot different than your corner teeth, and those look a lot different from your back molars. And this is just called heterodont. For the digestive tract of mammals, it is very similar to that of other vertebrates, although it does vary with the diet of the species. For example, herbivores eat lots of plants, so they eat lots of cellulose. So they can have something called an enlarged cecum, which is a fermentation pouch to help digest cellulose. And this is things like cows, if you think about it, right, cows. But a four-chambered stomach also helps digest that in portions. For circulation and gas exchange, like we talked about, there's a four-chambered heart, two atria, two ventricles, and it keeps the systemic and pulmonary circuits separate. 
So those high metabolic rates are going to require very effective gas exchange. So our respiratory pathways are very highly branched and they create a large, large, large surface area for gas exchange. And the lungs inflate and deflate and this uses just a negative pressure mechanism. So there's two types of gas exchange within the body. So there's inspiration, which is contraction of the diaphragm and expansion of the rib cage. And then expiration is the recoil of the lungs, the diaphragm relaxes, and it decreases the volume of the thoracic cavity. If you are a person that sings, you also know how important your diaphragm can be. For temperature regulation, the heat producing mechanisms have two categories. So we have shivering thermogenesis and non-shivering thermogenesis. So shivering is as it is, right? You shiver when you're cold, your body shivers. This generates a lot of heat for your body, but without very much movement. Non-shivering thermogenesis is just producing heat through the breakdowns of food and fats in your body. Countercurrent heat exchange also helps regulate heat loss. So arteries are surrounded by veins that carry blood back to the body, and when the blood returns through the veins, the heat transfers from the arterial blood to the venous blood, and this helps return the heat to the body instead of losing it to the environment. Now, sometimes, of course, you can still get way too cold, but for the most part, this system is pretty effective. For winter sleep and hibernation, so different mammals react differently to environmental extremes, right? Humans live in cold climates, but we have different clothing and things to help us survive. Mammals, on the other hand, that live in winter areas usually go into hibernation or winter sleep, which is just a period of winter inactivity if you're doing hibernation, and met metabolism, circulation, respiration all slows. But animals that do this also have to gorge themselves on food before the hibernation period because they lose a third to a half of their body mass. So they eat, 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 get really, really fat, and then they just kind of sleep through it and their body just burns all that storage. When mammals do winter sleep, they're not quite in hibernation, they're still alert, but they do become less active. For the nervous and sensory functions, as you know, I'm sure we have very complex nervous and sensory systems, and we have a very, very highly sensitive sense of touch. Olfaction is still important, which is smell, but it has been minimized over time, but the auditory senses have also become lessened after time. It's important to note, though, that vision is still an important feature in many mammals. For excretion, we excrete urea, so this is different from the birds and the reptiles that we were talking about. So the benefits of this is it's less toxic than that ammonia, and it doesn't require large quantities of water. On the other hand, it is highly water soluble, so it cannot be excreted as a solid, therefore we do still lose water. And the kidneys are that very important organ responsible for that. In terms of behaviors, mammals have very complex behaviors, and we'll get into this a little bit more in class. But pheromones are very important. They're used to recognize members of the same species, of the opposite sex, to communicate reproductive state, also for territory. It can also help induce sexual behavior. So if a male smells a female's pheromones, he's more likely to want to mate. For reproduction, most females undergo an estrus cycle. So this is when they are behaviorally receptive or able to mate. Some mammals are monoestrous and they only have a single yearly estrous cycle. Other mammals are polyesterous and have an estrous cycle multiple times. For example, humans, once a month, there's an estrous cycle. So we are receptive to reproduction 12 times a year. Fertilization is usually going to occur a few hours after the copulation, but some mammals use something called delayed fertilization where the female can store the sperm until a more favorable time. This is usually in areas of rough kind of survival. And fertilization can also occur right away, but the development can be paused. And another key word is gestation period. So this is the length of time that a female is pregnant. So it varies vastly based on species, as I'm sure you're aware of. And that is all for your notes.